Good evening, church. Good evening, his name is Otawa. And um, I praise the Lord. Hey, you I didn't say good evening back to her. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, my father, my prophet, my prophetess, Uma. Good evening, my Apostle Pridji and all my pastors. And I thank God and I praise the Lord Jesus to be here under your vicinity, Papa. Um, it's a privilege for me to be here, especially how the road was um, coming here. That was that easy, but the Lord protects me because so we're here. And um, Apostle Pridji, I want to... Papa, um, you permit me to thank Apostle PG for visiting us. And I want to thank you especially for last Sunday and for the word that you brought. I want to thank you for the book of Revelation. I want to thank you first to be a son to our, our prophet. I want to thank you for the book of Revelation. It's a book that I loved. And then the way that you have unraveled that book. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for heart to heart. Apostle Pitch, I want to thank you for your life. <laughs> thank God for your life. Uh, Apostle Pitch, um, I want to thank you again for the word on Sunday. That really helped me a lot. On Sunday, for those who were not there, um, that was about... Um, Move, removing mountain, like the way to pray, to pray plus faith, and then to remove mountain in our lives. And then you have said something like um, that really touched me. It's because we're not desperate enough. That is why things don't move in our life. And uh, being not desperate, I can say yes for sure. Like from, for some reason, I, I, I might like start to pray about something. And then if, for example, if, if our father said, now this week we're going to thank God. So I stop and I just thank God. So I go according to what my father or my mother tell us to pray. It's not that I'm not desperate, but I stop the prayer according to a problem, anything, to, to flow with the, with the river because I really believe in my prophet and my prophetess. So... Since that you have said that, I've been praying differently. Now it's like I know that God wants me to pray. He wants me to come to him, to humble myself. I don't know if it was pride because I know that God is going to do it, but you showed us it's a way like to come with humility, to ask my Father in heaven to help me. So um, the two questions that related to this, it's... Um, how to um, see like something is a mountain. Like in my mind, I can, I can have a problem and I don't know what part of it is, is it the mountain. And um, the other question is, how, how do I command a mountain like to, to see this is a mountain first and then to tell the mountain to, to move away and to go to the deep of the sea? And... Um, after all, how to decree, how to decree. Because I remember our father said, you know, if you're constantly in, in love with God, and you're walking with him all day, like at eight o'clock, you go in your room, you close the door and you said, heavenly father, and you start decree. So is decree some words all the day that I can decree? Or there's a special moment that I can decree inspired by the Holy Spirit? And the other question that goes with it is the blood of Jesus. I'm not going to say I'm tired, but I've been, heard people like blood of Jesus, you just apply the blood of Jesus. And I heard my father also said that one day that you have, you have to ask the Holy Spirit to um, apply the blood of Jesus. So I don't want it to be like um, a religious thing, just to use the blood of Jesus like this to cover my family or the blood of Jesus, what is that revelation so I can use it properly, so I can decree properly according to the word of God, like in my work with God, I want to grow in this, like to do things properly. So I thank you so much, Apostle Pridji, because I know that my life is going to change by your answer. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to ask the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, greetings, church, once again. And, uh, it, is, it, it, is, it is my absolute joy and privilege to be here under dad and mom's leadership 
And I truly believe that what the Lord is doing in this city is going to result in a great revival. And, and we are at the verge, we are at the verge of tapping into something huge. Yeah. And I believe it will be a blessing not just for Canada, but to the nations of the earth. Now, now coming to your question, sister, you know, the, the, the problem with many of us is that we, we take certain principles and we just eventually make it into a, a routine or into religion without understanding the seasons, without understanding what God is speaking right now, without understanding the ways or the strategy that the Lord is giving us for that particular season. And any time that we take the principles, it could even be scriptural principles. You know, like for example, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and Jesus said, these guys are tithing. So the tithe that these guys were doing, that had become religion. The principle was correct. The principle was from the scripture, but there was no heart behind it. There was no life in what they were doing. So we can pray prayers, we can make decrees, we can do things because it's a good principle, but sometimes we, we may not see the fruit of it because we, we are not doing it with the breath of God behind it. You know, so sometimes uh, that, is, that is what I meant, that, that sometimes we are not desperate enough to see and ask God, what, what do I need to pray for? How do I need to overcome this mountain? And for me, I'll tell you this, you know, there was this, there's a story of, of this widow of Zarephath. She was desperate. She was about to, you know, kill herself and her child after that last meal. However, at that point, there came a prophetic instruction to her. And she, even though she was desperate, even though she was ready to do this and just go about with the end of her life, that prophetic instruction now, you know, stopped her from doing what she was supposed to do. And she had to now submit to that prophetic instruction. She, in, in other words, she could no longer be that desperate. As soon as she's serving a meal to the prophet, she's also acknowledging that my need is not important right now. Like, in fact, her need was important. The fact that there was the last meal in the house, she and her son hasn't had food, and this is like the last meal. But what she's saying is, I'm not so desperate or I'm not so hungry that I'm unwilling to disobey this prophetic instruction. So in other words, you may be very desperate about your breakthrough, but you come to church and then the Lord says, today we are just thanking him. Today we are just worshiping. Today we are not crying out for our need. So you, what, you do, what you're receiving at that point is a prophetic instruction which is actually going to contradict with your desperation. Ah. Which is all, all right because that time it is necessary for us to obey that instruction and submit to that instruction because when we obey and when we submit to that instruction our breakthrough lies in that. You know? So, so it's not... So it's not, it's not just, okay, you know, it worked for that lady, so I'm going to always do the same thing, you know. It, it has to change from time to time to time. But at the same time, we, we cannot be on the other end of the spectrum where, you know, we, we, you know I, I'm just reminded of uh, this uh, story of the Shunammite lady who was hosting Elisha. You know, here is the prophetic voice in her house, and she has a need which she is not desperate about. She has tolerated her barrenness so long enough that she, it's like part of her life. The prophet is asking her, what do you need? How can I help you? And she's like, I don't need anything. I don't want God to do anything. I mean, that's, that's the other end of the spectrum where there is a prophetic voice, there is help coming, but we are not desperate enough or we are not hungry enough to get rid of that one thing. For whatever reason, we have uh, gone through disappointment so many times that we've like embraced that disappointment and we don't want to risk the, you know, walking on the water 
and we don't want to risk falling down, we don't want to risk embarrassment, and we just say, it's okay, everything is all right, you know, I don't want to take this risk. But, but that's also something we need to avoid. When we come into the church, when we come into the house of God, we are not just coming to uh, just take pointers that we can, you know, learn and say, oh, I, I learned five points. We are actually coming to get strategies on how we are going to make warfare during that week. We are coming to receive specific instructions on what are the prayers we are going to pray during this week. So some of the things that I, I, I try to imitate from dad is that, you know, when he would speak on Sunday, you know, before and after speaking also, he would tell us to pray certain things, you know, now you pray for this, now you do this. So for that week, I know this is what I need to intentionally pray. It's not just the word that he brought, but uh, the application of that word would have certain things that he would say. So I would hold on to those key points and, uh, and that becomes my prayer during the week. Uh, we all heard the 31st night service. Uh, such an awesome service. We were blessed. And, uh, the thing is, during the 31st night service, Dad had released a word uh, that, you know, the Lord is releasing somebody's visa. Yes. Yes. And, I'm, and, and I heard that and, you know, it didn't, it didn't click uh, anything in my heart at that time. You know, I just didn't receive it because I thought that's not for me. And then a couple of weeks later, uh, <laughs> I was re-listening to the word, the same word. This time I was re-listening to it. This is a Saturday night, you know, I was listening to it like 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening. Saturday night at around 10, 10, 30 p.m., I was listening to the word and dad reached that place. And then I said, hey, wait, I, I have applied for a Canada visa <laughs> and, and I, I need my visa to come too. So, you know, I, I can claim this as well. So Saturday night around 10 o'clock, I said, okay, this is, this is also for me. I'm going to be one of those 33 people, you know, that, <laughs> that, that, that prophesied over. And I just received that word and I sowed a seed and I said, I, I am not going to tolerate this delay. The problem was on the Canadian website, they said it, it's going to take 123 days for the visa to be processed. So I'm, I'm imagining it will take somewhere around June, July by the time my visa comes and then another month for me to plan and prepare and come. Uh, but so Saturday night, I received that word and I just saw a seed. And Sunday passed, Monday morning, 8 a.m. I got an email. Monday morning, 8 a.m. I got an email. Anybody who has applied for Canadian visa from India can testify that that's, that's not normal. That's not, that's not how it works. It's, it's funny because Monday morning I got that email and Tuesday I gave my passport. And so when I gave my passport, I asked them what is the normal time. They said, they'll go to Delhi, it'll come back, it'll be an average of 14 days for you to get your passport. Wednesday I got my passport back. Like, this, this, it's impossible. Amazon doesn't come that fast. Because there was a prophetic instruction. Because there was a word. And I had to get rid of my, you know, tolerance. And I had to become desperate. I had to become serious about what I wanted to do. See, it's very easy for me to say, oh, it's okay in God's time or at the right time, whenever. And, and, and because we do that, because we uh, take our pursuit of what God wants, us, wants to do through us and for us very casually, we miss out on so many blessings. I would not have been able to receive from dad this week if I would have just taken, okay, in God's time, it'll happen. It's necessary that sometimes we become desperate and not tolerate certain no's. Even if it looks like God is saying a no. Even if it looks like, you know, for example, the, the story of Jesus speaking to the Syrophoenician lady, Jesus technically was denying her. 
when Jesus said, don't you think that the children needs to be fed first? The children, my priority is to feed the children. My priority is to feed the people of Israel. So let me take care of them. So technically, Jesus was denying her need. This is God, the sovereign God, you know, in his sovereign will. He's saying this is not plan, plan A. You know, the, the, my plan A is to deal with the Israel, the nation of Israel, the lost tribes of Israel. But this lady says, that's it. I'm, I'm not going to give up just because you're only here for Israel. I'm, I'm still going to pursue till I, I, I can move your heart and till I can, I can get a breakthrough because this is a serious business. I, I need this blessing for my children. Same thing with Jesus' mother, Mary. When she went and spoke to Jesus saying, they've run out of wine, you know the reply Jesus gave? What is the reply Jesus gave? My time has not yet come. Can you, can you imagine? Jesus said, my time has not come. And still Mary said, let's do what he's asking us to do. Mary goes to the other servants in the house and says, let's just pay attention to what he's going to say next. I know it's not his time. I know that he's not right now ready, but we are desperate. We are hungry. And we can, with our hunger and with our desperation, we can move the mountains that are standing in our way. So there is a, there is a faith that comes as a result of us heeding to prophetic instructions, which means sometimes the prophetic instructions may ask you to do something that is not normal. You know, that may not be the normal expression of desperation. The normal expression of desperation would be to divide your meal into four and give one to the prophet, you know, and divide the other two. But it was, that's not, how the prophetic word was. The prophetic word was, give me that meal. So sometimes you may have to just obey the prophetic instruction and the other times you need to pursue that prophetic instruction out of desperation and both of it is necessary for us to receive our breakthrough. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, it's just like I'm not just to talk too much. Hello, Father. Hello, Prophet, Pastors. I, I will, my question it has been bothering me since a long time ago. I'm just right now I need a teacher, a teacher. <laughs> since I, I'm going to focus on your testimony that you gave last Sunday, and I want to understand when, when someone dies, okay, there's a, one thing that we have mentioned, you know, the people of God, we're going with him. We're going to be with him. But then, if I know, for example, I, well, I, know, I, have been, I have seen and I have been in that garden. And the last thing I want is to, to be back. Okay? So if I have been there and I just love the presence of the Lord, isn't it selfish to pray only because I love this man of God for him to be back to earth and just to just just because you know yes he's a good man he's doing wonderful things he's working for the church but at the same time i know that he is with him and there's no better place than be with him than just bring him back so i know that the, in the word says that we're going to uh, revive people but the revive people for me is people that they don't have jesus he's the life Revive people from people dead is just walking without Jesus. That's one thing. In the Old Testament, when Jesus was here, you know, he was reviving he, uh, Lazarus because he says he has a purpose to glorify God. Uh, Tabitha, uh, people that were working for the Lord, but there, Jesus was not risen at that time. So that, for me, there's a purpose for, to revive those people because they were not safe. Jesus was not lifted up. But you have, we have, and for me to pray for you to be back, isn't it that, I mean, my, my flesh is, is, is wanting you because I love you. But at the same time, 
you were there. Yeah. Uh, yes, you had a fight, you had a you know, an encounter with something, you know, it was, that it was not for God, but still, it was for me a fact that you were going to be with him. And isn't it, isn't it, this is our purpose just to be with him and just live, live with him? I don't know if, if I'm making myself, you know, clear. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I want to know, is it okay to pray for a man of God, whoever, not, not just a man of God, for a believer mm -hmm. to be back, to be raised for life? Isn't mm -hmm. it selfish for me to do that? Thank you. Thank you for your honest question. And, uh, and like, like that said, we, we appreciate questions. <laughs> Just so I can bring context for those who didn't come last Sunday, this man of God was dead. We prayed, they, he had, they had even tried to inject his heart. The heart had stopped beating to revive him. And God sent a word on a Sunday morning service that brought him back. So that was a testimony that she's referring to. Now, now, coming to your question, is it selfish for us to pray that somebody who is with Jesus, that he will he'll come back, that he will return? I think that uh, sometimes we, uh, our, our definition of heaven, our perspective about heaven is that, you know, that is that that is the ultimate place to be in, you know, and that that is our eternal home. But there is something so, so specifically mentioned about heaven. It's that many will rise to eternity, in, into eternal life. Many will be there in heaven. Some of them, they will barely make it into heaven. And some of them, they will make it and they'll have riches and gold and wealth and everything. Okay? Some of us, we are going to be in heaven and we will be shining like with the brightness of stars. Where, where are, there are others who are going to be shining with the brightness of like just a moon, perhaps. You know, that's what the Bible says. So there are different levels even in heaven. Whatever, once you pass from this side of eternity into heaven, then whatever, what you, whatever you've done, it's permanent. You, you, you cannot progress on the other side of eternity. Like whatever you've yeah. done, your, your growth is here on this side of eternity. Your reward is based on what you do here on the earth. You, you will not have a greater, better reward. You may make it to heaven, but the Bible says as someone just barely escaping flames, we may reach there, but we may not necessarily have a reward. And I know for a fact that I would have made it to heaven if I would have passed away. But I know that there is so many things that the Lord had prepared as a reward for me, which I couldn't have received if I would have passed away before I completed my assignment here on the earth. So, so I can experience the presence of Jesus here on the earth as much as I can do in heaven. How many of you know that God, the Father, He dwells in Jesus, right? Now Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He is going to dwell in you. So we can never assume that heaven is more full of God than earth is. A child of God who is the temple of the Holy Spirit, you carry heaven in you. You, you carry all of God, the fullness of God in you. So you are not going to have like more blood of Jesus in heaven than you have here on earth. That you will get more access. You know, the only difference is that the flesh will get out of the way. So it's easier. But it is still, you are still going to be limited by your revelation that you have had here. Yeah. You're still going to be limited with the limitations that you tolerated here. Because the Bible says, some will rise to eternal embarrassment. 
So can you imagine being in heaven for eternity and being embarrassed? Ah, I wish I would have pursued that. I wish I would have believed for that. I, I, I wish I would have agreed when the prophet said, I can be rich. <laughs> no, I mean, like so many things that we disbelieve. So many things that we question on this side of eternity and we get there and, and we see people who have done that and we see people who have actually, you know, gone that far. And that's why the Bible says God will wipe away their tears, which means some of us are going to cry. <laughs> We are going to cry, even in heaven. God will have to wipe away some of our tears in heaven. God will have to comfort us in saying, okay, I understand. I know you failed. I know you could have done better, but now you're here. God would have to still become our comfort in heaven. He will wipe away our tears. Wow. We're talking about the new Jerusalem and new earth. Yeah. So it's very necessary that we understand our job is not just to somehow make it into the presence of Jesus. Like Dad said, our job is to also bring heaven down to earth. Yes. So if, if I have been able to do everything, but I've, I've been unable to fulfill the will of God in my life. Because Jesus said, not everybody who calls me Lord, Lord, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven. They are the ones who will actually enter into the kingdom of God. So if I have died before I actually fulfilled God's will for my life, then I'm glad and I'm thankful that there is a church that can pray and bring me back so that I can fulfill God's will for my life. So that, so that I can pursue those assignments over my life. You know, There were so many prophecies that would have gone wasted if I would have died. Mm. Yes, I would have been in heaven, but so many prophecies would have been null and void. So many assignments that God had been speaking over my life from the time I'm a little boy, which wouldn't have been fulfilled if I would have died last year. And, you know, the one reason I, I asked my wife, uh, how did you manage the whole thing? She's like, I never believed you could die. And I said, why? <laughs> because she's like, there were so many prophecies over your life. How could you just die? And then I had to tell her, no, if, if people wouldn't have fought, <laughs> yeah, if people wouldn't fight for certain prophecies, it can die. It yeah. can, can go to waste. Yeah. That's why you see a Daniel rising up and standing in the gap and fighting for a prophetic word that Jeremiah gave, that in 70 years, I will bring my people back. Daniel didn't take it easy. He started fighting for that word. He started fighting for that prophetic word. Peter in the prison, you know, they didn't just say, okay, all, all the people are going to, all the disciples are going to be, you know, uh, persecuted. So Peter is enjoying his share of persecution. Let's just allow him to. No, they, he was sup supposed to be executed the next morning. That's what the Bible says. And the church decided, no, we are not going to allow this. We are going to sit into prayer this entire night. See, look at this. There was prophecies by Jesus himself that some of you are going to be slain. And yet, the, the church said, no, 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 we, we, we are not going to allow Apostle Peter to die. We are going to make sure that his life is extended. We're going to make sure that he can do more. He, that all the assignments on his life will be fulfilled before he passes away. So, 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 so I think, so I, I think that it's a, it's a good desire that we say, oh wow, you know, he's going to be with Jesus. You know, that's a great thing. But uh, it is. We also have to ask God. You know, is this the? Is this? Is this it? Was there more? Was there anything else? Now, I understand there are going to be times when we, have, we, we can, we would have contended for resurrection. We would have contended for breakthrough and we don't get it. So what happens in times like that is that we just, we just comfort ourselves by saying, oh wait, he's in God's presence. So it's okay. Which 
may be okay for comfort, but that may not always be the truth. We, we take what is being spoken to us for comfort and we establish that as our truth. And that's why sometimes we tolerate lack. That's why we tolerate poverty. That's why we tolerate a lot of things, you know, like, like growing up, my parents would always tell me, you know, if, if, you, if you become rich, you will become very proud. You know, that pride will actually enter in. So they, they would say, you know, poor, keep, poor poverty keeps you humble. So whatever they said to justify their lack became something that I'm like, oh, I need to be poor so that I can be humble. Till I met rich people also who are humble. And then I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute, it's possible for you to be rich and still be humble. You know, so sometimes the things that are spoken to us to comfort us, that then becomes our theology. Then, then we think, oh wait, it's okay. It's okay for us to tolerate death because somebody is going to heaven. No, it's not. It's not. Sickness is not our portion. Yeah. Death, like, like dad said, you know, someday we, we may have to die, but we, we will die not because of a sickness. We will die like John died, you know, where, where when it's time for us to go, we just go, we will not die. That, that's the term that dad used. We, we don't need to die, we can just go to heaven. You know, that's, that's a big difference. You don't have to go through pain and suffering because we are no longer under the curse of death. Amen? Amen. So anytime the enemy tells you it's okay to tolerate certain things because it's, it's comfortable for your flesh, for your emotions. Because it's not, it's not easy to, you know, fight this battle. Especially knowing that there is a chance that the, you know, you may lose this battle. Especially knowing all the emotions that all the highs and the lows. We're just looking for a closure in a matter. We just want to somehow just bury this thing, comfort the widow, comfort the children, and just make sure it's not too much of a mess. Because of which, we just don't want to pursue for something big. And I'm, I'm thankful that I had a father who pursued. And I'm thankful that I have a church. <laughs>